Welcome. Uh, I'm Lauren Beaupre. I am the current uh, Dr. David McGee um, Endowed Chair in Musculoskeletal Research and a professor here in physical therapy at the U of A, U of a with a joint appointment in the Division of Orthopedic Surgery um, and do clinical outcome research. Um, on behalf of the U of A, I'm delighted to welcome you to the second um, Dr. Cy Frank Legacy Lectureship series here. Um, Dr. Cyril Frank, or Cy, as he was known to many of us, um, was really internationally known and acclaimed for his visionary um, work in looking at effective public health care. Um, he believed that a public health care system was sustainable and could be effective if clinicians and researchers worked together and didn't work in their silos. He believed in the value of multidisciplinary um, clinical research and was working very hard to try and implement and get research evidence into practice to try and improve how healthcare looked right up to the time of his passing in March 2015. The loss of Psy created a, a large hole, certainly in our healthcare environment and indeed in many of our lives. But so this created a desire to um, create this series, a legacy to, to recognize the work that he performed and, continue, and ensure that it continued and that we have impact. So the Cy Frank Legacy Lectureship recognizes ongoing work to improve healthcare and the di disciplines that really matter to Cy and are reflected in both his academic, his clinical, and indeed really his public service career. Um, Last year, the first leg of this lectureship was held at U of C, and this year it's going to be presented three times. Uh, uh, Dr. Noseworth has already presented at the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences at their annual conference in Ottawa. Today represents the middle leg of the journey here at the University of Alberta, and there'll be a third presentation at the UBC campus in Vancouver um, on October 20th. We are delighted here at the Faculty of Rehab Med and the University of Alberta partner with the McKaig, in, the McKaig Institute for Bone and Joint Health, yet another legacy from Dr. Cy Frank and work with Bud McKaig, um, to, to partner to share this um, lectureship series for you. Um, and really, the goals of this lectureship are to promote the ideals of clinical research through engagement and exposure of the broad healthcare community to really work towards improving healthcare. Um, and these are really matters that were very close to Cy's heart and clearly reflected in his career. So now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Martin Ferguson Pell to come and introduce our guest speaker. Dr. Ferguson Pell is the current CEO of the Alberta Bone and Joint Health Institute, yet another legacy of Dr. Frank. So, Martin. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Beaupre. Um, and thank you for providing this background um, to the important lectureship that we're celebrating um, this afternoon. Um, as, as Dr. Beaupre said, I'm Martin Ferguson Pell, and I'm here today as the Executive Director of the Alberta Bone and Joint Health Institute. And the Institute is, is as uh, Dr. Beaupre said, an example of Cy Frank's many legacies that keep on contributing to the quality of life of Albertans. Cy and Bud McCaig, Bud McCaig had a vision for creating improvements in healthcare for Albertans that was supported by the rich seam of data that lies within our healthcare system. They brought together surgeons and clinicians with researchers, analysts and health policy specialists to mine and interpret clinical data that is carefully curated through our institute. We work closely with the Bone and Joint Health Strategic Clinical Network to enhance patient outcomes and increase the effectiveness and impact of hardworking clinicians across the province. I'm sure many of you share my experience where barely a day goes by without a reminder of Cy's contribution to healthcare in Alberta and in Canada. Often we reflect on what Cy might have done in a particular situation. Cy was a remarkable example of selfless leadership and total commitment to the greater good, which of course is such a powerful Canadian value. This afternoon it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tom Noseworthy. Together and with others, Tom and Sai set the stage for multidisciplinary healthcare transformation in Alberta, work that led to the creation of the strategic clinical networks. This disruptive concept for embedding research into the clinical setting, or as Sai liked to call it, Alberta's living lab, has resulted in a transformation to healthcare innovation that is prized by Albertans and coveted by other provinces. 
Dr. Noseworthy is an inspiration to clinicians and academics striving to create high-performing healthcare systems for patients, families, and providers alike. Tom, like Sai, is known for his ability to initiate vigorous di dialogue and ask hard questions that influence the positive innovation and change in our systems. He does so with a wide academic perspective, having interests that have included critical care, access to services, health technology assessment, and health information. He's published over 150 papers and book chapters and has given over 500 presentations. In addition, Dr. Noseworthy understands the realities of healthcare management. He was Vice President of Medicine and then CEO of the Royal Alexandra Hospitals from 1989 to 1995. He joined Alberta Health Services as an embedded researcher in 2011 and was the Associate Chief Medical Officer, Strategic Clinical Networks until January 2015. Dr. Noseworthy was awarded the Alberta Centennial Medal in 2005 and was named one of Alberta's top 100 physicians of the century by the Alberta Medical Association and the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Alberta. In 2007, Dr. Noseworthy was awarded the Order of Canada for Contributions to Health Policy and Medicare. In 2012, he received the Diamond Jubilee Medal. More recently, Dr. Noseworthy has created a wonderful opportunity for incoming medical students at the University of Calgary's Cummings School by teaching the Healthy Populations Health Systems course, for which he received the Honor Roll Award for the past consecutive five years. It gives me great pleasure to ask you to give a warm welcome to Dr. Tom Noseworthy, who will present the 2017 Cy Frank Legacy Lectureship. Thank you. Hi everyone. Hi everyone on the screen. Uh, colleagues, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen, special guests, people that love Cy Frank, welcome today. Cy Frank was a dear friend. Uh, he was a close colleague. And he was well known to most everyone that's here today in one way or another and those that are on the webcast. Offering this legacy lecture is of unparalleled and deep personal honor for me. I, I miss him dearly and I think about him every day. Um, here he is starting medical school. As someone in the audience said a little earlier, nice hairdo. To preface this presentation, I declare that um, for me, I think I just came off him, sorry that um, I have no conflicts uh, of interest. Uh, I uh, am with the uh, Cummings School of Medicine, University of Calgary, it's my sole employer. Uh, today I'm going to try to avoid name dropping. Uh, there are many people who should be credited with the work that is going to be discussed here today, and I'm gonna try to avoid doing that because I won't be able to do it justice, so please forgive me. Uh, and, and also, I don't want to name individuals because a lot of what we're talking about today was done, everything was done as teams. Um, because, of course, research is a team sport, and so is healthcare. And the picture behind you shows the consummate team leader. Here we are at the OA team grant meetings, and Sai taking his place at the podium uh, in his usual way as the consummate team master. Please, let me please acknowledge the Cummings School of Medicine, Alberta Innovates, uh, Faculty of Rehabilitation of Medicine, and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences for sponsoring this lectureship. Uh, it was a wonderful event um, last week in Ottawa, and I uh, was delighted that Hélène Levesque, um, longtime partner for SAI, was able to attend and be with us uh, at that event. Uh, Sai's uh, sons are not able to be with us here today, but I'll recognize them. He was so very proud of uh, Ryan and Tim. Um, uh, plastic and orthopedic surgeons, uh, respectively, um, and he uh, was very proud of them. Uh, and please also allow me to recognize his lifelong administrative assistant, and you know most everybody here would have run into Judy Crawford, 
Uh, I'm not sure if Judy is actually uh, on um, the webcast today, but if not, uh, I pass along warm regards to her. And, and then two close colleagues, uh, lifelong close colleague, Tracy Woslick, uh, and more recently acquired colleague, Mikey Mork, who's with us here today. So what do I want to do in this lecture? Uh, what do I want to try to accomplish? And uh, to do that, um, I've uh, got uh, three uh, sections in mind. It won't necessarily uh, occur in sequence, but the first of those, I want to talk about um, uh, healthcare systems that are seeking to learn and to improve uh, and to be seen as high performing. Uh, and I want to discuss some of what I call be the 12 characteristics that would be very um, uh, aligned to that. I then want to um, go into uh, talking about, to get high performance, you need strategy. Uh, you need structures. Uh, you need processes. And they have to be configured within a learning health environment. And moreover, there has to be a line of sight from the time when you do the research, uh, the measurement, uh, to actual implementation, right down the line to clinical policy and practice. And um, I'm going to use the strategic clinical networks to uh, demonstrate that line of sight. Uh, there are now 15 SCNs in place, I'm happy to say, um, and um, some have been in place now for just over five years. Uh, some are just a little under one year old, um, and there's something to say. There, we're starting to see now some of the outcomes that we had hoped for. The final thing I'd like to say is, is I'd like to talk about, uh, beyond the SCN exemplars, I'd like to swing back and, and talk about how those exemplars of the SCNs fit back inside the 12 characteristics. And in do so, I want to raise, raise three issues just in passing that I think are unattended business that uh, for me are vexing issues. That's primary health care, uh, Canada-wide uh, waste and affordability. So my agenda in short is uh, where do we need to go? Some of the examples of how we have been getting there and perhaps some business get to be addressed. That's the agenda. And there would be Sai at work, uh, as he often was at his desk. Now, before starting the Strategic Clinical Networks in 2011, there were three healthcare conferences uh, held uh, in, uh, in this city, actually in Edmonton. Um, and we invited experts from around the world um, that um, came to speak to us uh, from systems that we felt were notable to be high-performing systems elsewhere in the world. Sai and I were charged with summarizing the conferences. Um, which we actually did do. And perhaps one of my own personal regrets in all of this is we never went the distance and finalized this and actually published that work then, which we really should have done, and that would have been six or seven years ago. Uh, I've gone back to that list of things, and I've done some violence to it. Cherry-picked it, altered it, modified it, uh, and added to it. And I'm going to present those 12 things to you uh, here today as what I think are characteristics that are certainly associated with high performance uh, in learning systems. Um, and the 12 that I'll present are certainly by no means universally accepted. Um, there's lots written on this, as you know, um, and particularly in recent years. And the 12 that I'm going to um, suggest are certainly by no means a, a standardized set of considerations. But I think uh, you'll find them important, and I want to tie them back into the SCNs themselves. So what are these things that I speak of? Um, first and foremost, uh, innovation and measurement are the foundations. Uh, that's the cornerstones. Innovation points the way. Measurement tells you if you are getting there. The nucleus. The uh, nucleus of the system is the patient and the public and uh, surrounded by a responsive primary health care system. To achieve high performance, whew, it didn't even touch it. I'll go backwards, though. To achieve high performance as a health system, structures and processes must be in place to use that best evidence and performance measurement as a means of achieving outcomes. The innovation engines in the form of clinical networks are well suited to drive change. Uh, four, the patient voice must be heard and included. Five, optimal care based on best evidence must be codified and has to be codified into clinical care pathways. And while these represent the standard of practice, the blueprint against which you can build measurement, um, uh, care always has to be individualized and customized to the person. High performance can't be achieved without comprehensive longitudinal pers person-specific health microdata. You've got to know what's going on. And it should be able to be securely linked to an interoperable health record. One person, 
One record. Strategies and processes for spreading and scaling, this is an important one for Alberta right at this point in time, must be conceptualized and incorporated before you start the pilots. Number eight, resource hungry healthcare systems must find ways to underwrite innovation change. This is not going to come from new and additional resources. The cupboard is bare. <laughs> The incentive and the fuel for this innovation that we're going to need is going to have to come from waste capture, like never before, uh, and a payback model, which I'll discuss uh, shortly. Learning health systems are going to need to take some part of their revenue, some part of it, and invest in innovation and targeted investments. Uh, if you're going to do that, you better be able to assess the impact of that research and its value, or otherwise you're wasting public money. And then, of all of these, none is more important than this, the last and the twelfth. If you want innovation and measurement to really change policy and practice, the top of the organization, those that make the decisions and are responsible and accountable for the organization's welfare, um, have to connect with those that are delivering the care, right down to the level of the bedside. Not easy to do. This one is a critically important one for sure. Uh, let me talk about the SCNs just to fill in the background for those of you that might not be very familiar with them. Um, I started over my presentation by, by saying that I, I think the SCNs are early examples of what I think uh, are learning health systems. Um, the work, all the work that I'm talking about today has been done one way or another or was done with uh, Cy Frank and uh, in one or more of his critical roles. Uh, and as I said, after I mention a few of the exemplars from the SCNs, I'll circle back and talk about those 12 characteristics that I just uh, showed you. So as of today, um, there are now four problems with a single healthcare delivery system. Um, when we did it in May 2008, um, so you will remember, um, everyone thought we were crazy. I think maybe some of us thought that a little at that time ourselves uh, for a point in time. So that's May 2008, and now there's four delivery systems in the country at a provincial level, uh, which is interesting uh, to watch. Now, Alberta Health Services uh, suddenly needed to be able to take uh, uh, scalable approaches to healthcare delivery. Now, now suddenly it was no longer good enough for the jurisdictions of the province to fight with each other. We had to figure out how to actually get along. Um, and, you know, while it may not have been seen to be explicit, at least as we developed the SCNs, we were very mindful of the Don Abedian model of quality improvement, where structures are critically important to be aligned with processes in order to achieve the outcomes. And following that type of general kind of approach, uh, we decided we needed to develop some kinds of provincial structures that would accomplish what we think uh, was the goal, which is the triple aim here, better health, better health outcome, better value for money type of approach. So in 2011, as you well know, um, uh, AHS was now getting on to three years old and the zones were formed. And the zones needed to be formed, north, south, central, Edmonton and Calgary, they needed to be formed to look after local area needs. And every zone is different. Uh, and sometimes we get too possessed with the zone that we happen to be living in at the time, whether it's Edmonton or Calgary or otherwise, but we have to realize that we live in a province where, you know, about 3% uh, of the population is living in 50% of the land mass. And, you know, so providing equitable uh, quality of services there with good outcomes is not necessarily easy to do. And to do that, um, the zones uh, certainly uh, needed something that would call, cause a provincial chemistry to take place, something that would, would uh, eliminate potential care gaps, that would deal with care inequities, that would be driven by measurement at a provincial level. And so that's where the SCNs actually came about, as you know, and we saw the first ones develop in June 2012, and now those first ones are just getting a little uh, more than five years old. Uh, and this has happened simply because from the very beginning there's been support from the administration of AHS and from the senior leadership that this was going to happen. And there were sufficient number of clinician leaders that were willing to be involved that we would be able to at least begin to start the top-down, bottom-up process that Sai so frequently talked about. Now, as you know, each SCN has got a dyad partner relationship. There's a senior medical director, a senior provincial director in each one. Uh, and then the, the novel approach to us is also to add a scientific director, which is meant to link us to the academic community and drive 
knowledge to action. And then that leadership has got a core committee. The core committees have sneaked up in size now over the last five years. I don't think there's any now under 35 or 40 people that assemble fairly regularly. But it's still an interesting mix of individuals. Some physicians, clinicians, uh, policy maker in each one, few academics, um, and uh, patients and members of the public. And the core committee actually sets priorities. It sets direction. It, tends to drive what the nature of the change is, but of course SCNs don't manage anything. They have to work with other people in the system, and particularly uh, the zones and people in operations in order to actually get things done. And of course, SCNs use measurement. They use data uh, in order to try to drive their areas of interest. And you know, one of the things we often do is look at variation in outcomes as a target for where we might want to look for clinical improvement. Wherever you see variation, there's cause to look to see if there's something that one might be able to do about it. Now, each one of the SCNs has patients involved. Some are patient advisors, but some have been actually trained. Very novel program that many of you, I'm sure, are quite aware of, PACER, Patient Advisors and Community Engaged, Engaged Researchers, PACER, Patient Advisor, Community Engaged Researchers. So these are patient, people with patient experience that uh, are willing to uh, spend a year in training. I don't know why this thing goes on its own, but I'll stand back and I'll try not to touch it again. <laughs> Uh, but these people, there's now 40 PACERs, they've been given a year of training in qualitative research. They're very, very different people right now because they've come at this with a patient experience to start with. And so now we've got uh, some PACERs that uh, are certainly writing project grants uh, and uh, we have seen our first few publications coming out uh, where the patients themselves, uh, the PACERs, are actually uh, in the authorship. So um, with that as a background, that's what the SCNs are. There's now about 40 different projects of various sorts at various stages of maturity or completion that the SCNs have been doing or are doing in this last five year period. And it's a little hard to cherry pick out one or two examples, but I think I will out of the 40. And there are many more that we could pick, but remember now the ones that we're picking, these are being scaled to the provincial level, which is no small feat. And there's no other province out there right now that's got the, the, uh, the technical capacity and the structures and the processes to scale things uh, as we do now in Alberta. So let's start with the first example, the Stroke Action Plan. Well, um, I've chosen this as an example, really, basically, of just advancing evidence. Uh, but it was really driven by variations in stroke outcomes. Uh, we saw substantial difference between the best performers in Alberta and what I would say the uh, less uh, good performers in Alberta in terms of 30-day stroke mortality. As much as over 100 deaths per thousand in one zone versus another, and those are the kinds of variations that demand uh, attention to see if there's indeed anything that could be done about them. So the Stroke Action Plan is a model of care that's it's meant to give stroke unit equivalent care in rural and remote areas uh, of the province. Uh, and the goal in the beginning was like, we gotta get, we gotta start salvaging brains, uh, basically, um, crudely put. Um, we have to get the thrombolytics in faster, therefore you gotta image them quicker, you gotta get to them earlier and make a decision that this is something that needs rapid attention. Uh, and then importantly to a rehab medicine audience uh, folks here, um, very early onset and aggressive physio has been a really important factor. So what actually happened? 15 small centers signed up, uh, and there was fairly quickly a, a reduction in length of stay of 17%. Um, we now um, uh, see uh, 17 fewer patients per year going into long-term care. 88% uh, get access to rehab. Now, this is rural and remote patients within 48 hours now. And in terms of stroke outcomes, 67 improved in activity limitation scale. 67 percent improved in impairment scale. Complication rate went down from 9.9 percent. Uh, uh, and a 30-day stroke mortality went from 10.5 to 9.6. Small changes, but meaningful changes, particularly where they were accomplished in the northwest part of this province. And so summing it all up, um, you know, there were 3,377 bed days saved from the earlier discharge and earlier access to rehab and stroke action plan and patients uh, were better off in their neurological assessments at 30 days. So this won the 2014 Canadian Stroke Award uh, for the best example uh, in the country of patient care program and um, this one should be shared and scaled nationally. 
Why are we not doing this for all parts of this country, rural and remote? It's doable, it's not expensive, and we could save some brains of Canadians. Second one, um, SCNs got interested in overuse of pharmaceuticals and inappropriate care, and they took on a project called Appropriate Use of uh, Antipsychotics in Long-Term Care Facilities. AUA, Appropriate Use of Antipsychotics. Um, there's a lot of antipsychotics getting used in our, uh, in our facilities uh, across the entire country, not just in Alberta. Uh, and these medications are not that good for your health. Um, they make you fall down. Uh, they make you lose consciousness. They make you confuse in front of the public. They make you incontinent. Um, they can make you do a lot of different things. And all of this takes place on the background of polypharmacy and seniors, as you well know, is an ever-present problem that we've got in the country right now. So something had to be done about this, and the surprising thing in comparative terms is Alberta had amongst the highest use of antipsychotics in Canada in 2012, amongst the highest use for people that did not have psychosis. 26.8% of people were on antipsychotics in our long-term care facilities. So um, one of the keys to doing something about this was to start talking about interprofessional medication reconciliation. What do you want? Why do you want it? Do you need to stay on it and what have you? So the team dynamic started talking about medications, started looking for alternatives to dealing with agitation and anxiety. How about a little music, maybe the pets, other things that could uh, reduce uh, the nighttime blast of an antipsychotic in order to settle people down. So what actually happened? We had 11 early adopter sites. Uh, an antipsychotic uh, inappropriate use was reduced by 20%. So what does this mean? That in the 657 beds in which there was an impact, one third of the residents were removed from antipsychotics without any negative consequences. No, no more frequently walking out the doors, no more falls, no more nursing hours, none of that. Happier relatives. And now, um, working in partnerships, the SCN has scaled this up and it's scaled up now to the 14,000 long term care beds uh, in the province and the 170 facilities that we have. And there are now 1,000 fewer residents on antipsychotics. Now, the Kind High data from 2015 is interesting because now Alberta is the best performer, the lowest use of inappropriate antipsychotics. Um, in Canada now, and we used to be amongst the highest, and that was in 2012. So the team is now supporting this work nationally and trying to scale it. They're working with the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, developed a toolkit so that other provinces can start doing this. There's no reason why we need to continue to be uh, intoxicating our seniors with antipsychotics, and uh, maybe we should move on to other meds next. Okay, the third example, vascular risk reduction. Well, I thought I'd choose this one because it's the most common reason why it's going to kill someone in this room is vascular disease, heart disease. Number one killer, even in the developing world, go figure. Number one. Number two, stroke, even in the developing world, go figure. Everything's changed. So it makes sense to deal with vascular risk reduction. And of course, we, we were advantaged that there's been quite a lot going on. Multiple uh, SCNs got involved with this, not just cardiovascular stroke, diabetes, obesity, nutrition, cancer, addiction, mental health, SCNs, all four uh, jumped in, uh, worked with the AMA and researchers throughout the province uh, to tackle this. And, you know, we, we ought to remind ourselves that, um, uh, that the estimate is now in the Alberta adult population that about 90% of the adult population carries at least a one vascular risk factor. 90%. It's like everybody here. At least one vascular risk factor. Now, the Council of the Federation of the Canadian Premiers, you know that they have been around for a while, and they recommended the adoption of what is called Sea Change. Sea Change in 2014. Sea Change is based on the Canadian cardiovascular harmonization of national guidelines. That's where C change comes from. And what is all that about? That's all about identifying and managing people at risk for vascular disease. So who's here has silent risk factors and you don't know? And you're not attending to them. Who here has hypertension and you don't know it? Whose lipids are off? What are the modifiable risk factors that just ordinary folks like us might reasonably have? 
Now, so far, uh, what has happened is 1,000 family doctors have been trained uh, in sea change and 48 community-based pharmacists. And to date, 350 physicians have intervened with 400,000 patients in Alberta to change their vascular risk. And 52 pharmacists have reached out to 700 of their patients. And in Sea Change, we chose a private sector partner in Alberta as well, a private sector partner that would make a heart healthy um, organization. Um, it was a smallish organization, 190 uh, employees uh, were offered screening. Half of them said yes. And half of them had vascular risk uh, of a moderate to high nature. Uh, and many of them then subsequently got enrolled in the case management process for follow-up and risk reduction. That's proactively intervening before a problem occurs. And that's a private sector employer that did it. Wow, no reason why we couldn't scale that one to the whole country. Now, those are only three examples. There's 40 plus of them out there uh, just from the major projects that the SCNs are doing alone. But let's, let's just tie it back to the slides that long ago got away from me. Um, and go back to this one, number one again. It's self-evident. Innovation and measurement is, 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 is where we're going here, and, and the measurement tells us really that we're, how we're getting there. Think about sea change, the harmonization guideline. Think about stroke action plan. Where did that knowledge come from? That came from the two medical schools in this province. It came from the Mazankowski Institute. It came from the Libyan. It came from the knowledge of people working in this province. We had the best stroke outcomes in Calgary. The best cardiovascular outcomes for MI were here in Edmonton. Generalize them. Why wouldn't you? In fact, isn't it irresponsible not to? So why doesn't that happen? Because you've got to have a strategy to do it, and you've got to have the structures and processes to make it actually happen. Well, number two, the nucleus of all of this is the patient and the public surrounded by primary health care. Now, let me actually say what I mean by that. Surrounded by primary health care, offered within the configuration of a medical home, embodied within a social contract, constructed on the foundation of trust, and informed by an electronic health record. We do not have that in Alberta. And uh, we actually are a long ways away from it. Take heart, we don't have it in the rest of the country either. And in some of those places, we're even further away from it. This is the first of the vexing problems I want to mention. Our primary health care system um, is uh, not what it should be. No insult to those of you in primary health care. No insult to you if you're a family doctor, no. But tell me it's not true. When I say to you, I don't see any difference in primary health care now than when I was a family doctor in the 70s. I, I, I don't see it. Yeah, there's changes, there's LINs and PCNs and all kinds of, of formation, but do we have what we really want? Remember what I said? Configuration of a medical home embodied in a social contract constructed on the foundation of trust informed by an electronic health record. I, I don't think so. Where's the organized community-based governance for primary health care? Hmm. Why, were we, why were we so slow to adopt the medical home philosophy? Whose interest is not being served with that? What's the social contract that each one of you have for your system? 6,500, 6,500, 6,500 each. What are you getting? How do you know you want to get it? Shouldn't there be some form of social contract with the system in some way? Couldn't that be part of what the medical home philosophy was all about? Anytime I ever talk, I hear anybody talk about medical home, they automatically rest to talk about payment. No, let's start talking about the philosophy of care. And then we'll worry about the best way of paying people after that. Primary health care needs a boost. And at least, let me at least say on one positive note here, thank goodness we finally launched the primary and integrated health care network. Uh, to um, help it with that agenda. It only took five long, painful years for that to happen. Let's hope now that things uh, will really change, and I wish you luck.
in it. Uh, to achieve high performance in the health system, structures and processes must be in place to use best evidence, performance measurement. Uh, I think we've, we've been through that, the clinical engines uh, that I've mentioned. There's a growing literature bent, uh, basis out there now about clinical networks. Uh, it's getting stronger. The evidence is increasing that, that these can be constructed in such a way to improve outcomes. Uh, but it's got to be preceded by sound strategy. You've got to have structures that make sense with processes. But in the end, for a learning organization to achieve, you've got to put clinicians in structural configurations, give them processes, and support them to make necessary change. Without that, it will not happen. Patient voice. While it's not just inv inviting them to the meeting, and not hoping that they show up, and informing them, or just involving them. No, no, it's quite a bit more than that. We're now at the age where we've got to start using the concept and practice the realities of co-design. Hey, Steve, I don't want you to tell me what my care is. I got my own ideas, so let's kind of like work it out. And you're going to start seeing more of that. People want to co-design in their care, and they want to be involved with it, and we're going to have to equip them to, in fact, do that. Uh, I'm dragging, so let me move on here if I can, and simply say this. You're going to have to codify best practice in clinical care pathways. That's the blueprint. That's what helps us understand that we're doing the right thing. We can build a measurement framework around it. So sea change was that, uh, for sure. Um, and um, I'd be remiss, I think, uh, even in the interest of the short time I have here, I, I, with a rehab medicine faculty here, I've got to talk about bone and joint here. So let me just mention the longest standing clinical care pathway that we have. And you know, you, you folks know about it. So uh, for those that don't know about it, you know, we do about 10,000 hips and knees uh, replacements uh, every year in, in Alberta. That's a sizable uh, chunk of activity. Uh, now, Alberta's orthopedic surgeons are ahead of the pack, most of the country. In fact, they're the envy of most of the country because they get to actually get together and um, share their performance reports, which is a novel thing to do. Um, and they can discuss their performance, and they know how to improve it as a consequence. So if you took the arthroplasty pathway, as has been done over a five-year period, and you looked at it, there's been an increase in 79% of surgical volume and only an increase in 3% of the beds. Said in another way, 35,800 bed days have been saved. 35,800, that's a lot. Well done. 37.7 uh, million if you were going to monetize it. Wonderful. The average waiting times now are 22.3 days from the decision to treat to the actual timing. Uh, readmission rates are 4.2%. Patient satisfaction went up uh, from 89% in 2010. is now 97%. Red cell transfusion rates, interesting one. We used to, 19.5% of the cases used to use red cell transfusions. We're down to 6.3% now. They decided they would do something about it. They saw their data, said we can do this. The evidence was there that patients would be just as well off. So it got done. Every place in Canada should be using the arthroplasty pathway, right? So key feature number six, High performance can't be achieved without longitude and person-specific uh, health information. Uh, I won't dwell on this too long. Uh, this is another one of those sort of uh, truly vexing issues. Um, we're a long ways away from one person, one record. You know that, despite best efforts of a lot of people, some of which are in this room. Um, and you know the problem is here is that we're, we're not only not doing well, we're doing really poorly compared to the rest of the world. And when it comes to health data linkage of our health data to other uh, person-specific information, uh, 20 years ago, Canada was in the lead in data linkage in this country and availability of linked data at a person-specific level. And now we're terribly behind, as the latest Canadian Academy of Health Sciences report uh, told us. If you're going to um, have pilots, then you've got to have spread and scaling. Now, I'm getting a little tired of people that stand in front of us and say, you know, we're just another country that's um, um, an exemplar in doing pilot projects, and they don't go anywhere. Well, I don't know the people that say that, what they want us to do about the pilot projects. Do they want us to kind of give it up altogether? 
Uh, to say that we're only doing pilots and that they're dead-end streets has an element of truth, but uh, on the contrary, if you've got a good idea and innovation, I think it would be wise to probably start small and you know, pilot it and then scale it up. And now that's where the problem is. It's not that we're a country of pilots. We're a country that doesn't know how to take the pilots and scale them up. So let's go back to that issue and the scaling up issue, what the SENs would say, you want to scale up something before you even start the pilot, let's get all the people in the room that are going to be the consequence of this scaling up. They've got to be involved with the original design and measurement and execution of the work. Not stand waiting till it's done and then hurry up and get ready. They have to be involved from the get-go. Critical feature for scaling is involve those people early on to whom there will be a scaling impact. So sometimes it goes when I don't want it to, and now I want it to and it won't go. So I'm not sure what I should do about that, but uh, let me just move on if I can. I can't hit number eight, so I don't know what I should do here. It's probably down there. Yes, here we go. Thank you. That helps. Yeah, when it's down on the floor. I want to get number eight. That one. Yeah. So there's no more money. Um, and so it's not going to have to come from new resources, and I'm going to speed up here now because I'm close to the end, and, and this is what we need to do, whereas number nine is how we need to do it. And I know there's some people starting to work on that very subject right now here in this room. On the issue of waste reduction, we've done a few things in the province already. We can beat our chest because we don't routinely order vitamin D anymore. We don't use nitric oxide as often in the unit anywhere, Mike, right? We don't do drug screening in eMERGE anymore for psychiatric consultation, but we haven't gotten at the waste. You want to get at the waste, you've got to do it the right way. And um, part of it is this number nine. The incentive and fuel for getting at the waste is you've got to have a capture and a payback uh, method. Uh, this is really, really important. We certainly haven't yet accomplished it here, but if every time you make a gain, uh, your budget is indeed uh, curtailed as a consequence, then forget the engagement that's going to follow as a consequence. And, um, you know, the problem is we keep making decisions about funding all kinds of things in the province, um, but nothing happens. So, like some of you here in this room have been on a committee over the last many years where we get to make decisions. Uh, about, or recommendations, about whether or not something should be publicly funded. And we've made uh, scores of choices about things that should be added to the public fund system. Uh, but uh, the line of sight uh, doesn't usually see many of them uh, implemented. Hysteroscopic tubal ligation, pancreatic auto cell transplantation, Oncotec DX. I won't name any more. There's lots of name. We agreed they should be funded, but no money was ever attached to them. So nothing happened. So what's the message? Well, why'd you approve it if you weren't planning to fund it? But there's no money is the answer. Well, the answer is you've got to tie the innovation in the reduction of the waste. They've got to be tightly linked. If you want something new, where's the money coming from? You know, the whole idea of opportunity cost has got to be given a far more greater consideration before and we want a payback model that works that incents the clinicians to continue to find the waste. Learning health systems need to make a meaningful portion of their eligible revenues as an investment. And here, in the interest of time, I won't dwell on it, but, you know, Catherine was a key to this, and Jacques Magnin was key to this, but Cy helped make this happen. Prius, the Partnership of Research and Innovation Health System, the Prius Awards, five million a year, that wouldn't be going into the system without it. There's 30 projects going on out there right now, some of which eventually will bear the kind of fruit that I showed you already from the SCNs. That's a healthcare system investing in research. We're going to have to see more of that. And if we do, and this is size work too, if you're going to do the research, then measure its impact and show its value, or give it up. Research impact assessment is here to say. The first framework for the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences, SI chaired, research impact assessment is now being used across the country. We use it in CIHR, we use it in one of the NCEs. Uh, and the National Alliance uh, for uh, Health Organization funding in the country is now using uh, this CAS framework regularly to assess research impact assessment. And then, of course, to sum it up into all the things that I said before, the top down has got to meet the bottom up if you're going to truly make the difference. 
So I'm running out of time. Let me steam towards the end. And I said there was, there was, there was three vexing subjects I wanted to talk about. I've already mentioned primary health care, and I won't again. And I've already mentioned MACE, I won't again. But I, I, I will mention this one. That's affordability. Affordability. <clears throat> you know, in every year since Medicare started in 71, with the exception of three years, every single year, the cost of the healthcare system is above the increase in CPI. Not by a little bit, by a lot. 3%, 4%, 5%, 6%, every single year CPI is going up, but the healthcare system is always going up more and more and more every year. And we've convinced ourselves that that investment is necessary and worthwhile, despite the fact that we know an awful lot about social health determinants now and how we could make people healthier by spending money differently. 6,500, 6,500, 6,500 each. Wow, that's a lot. We're not the most. We're in the top of the pack. Um, and we've gotten to a point now where I'm going to make the argument that um, we can no longer increase the funding of the healthcare system. Sorry. It's time to link it, really link it, and firmly link it um, to growth in, in economy, not just federally, provincially. So every year, year over year, you get nothing if the economy doesn't grow, and you only get the growth in the economy. Tough. But otherwise, what you're really doing is shifting money into other areas, uh, or not shifting money into other areas where you might make a bigger difference on health. So let me conclude, if I might, uh, appropriately so. Um, why have I taken your time to talk about 12 things, the SCNs and these exemplars in the first places? Well, it's because Canadian healthcare needs more innovation. It needs more, more than is actually connected to reality. And there's a line of sight. We can see it making a difference in policy and practice with a meaningful incorporation of the patient voice like never before. It's not only possible to do this, it's now become really necessary because we're actually out of money at a time when, sorry, our quality is not exactly great by international standards. In fact, it's kind of low in most things. And we're bloated with waste. And we're maxed out in affordability. Uh-oh. You can't buy your way out of this one this time. The year-over-year -year increase won't come. Used to be a desk in the CEO's drawer, right? Or a drawer in the desk, I should say. And you'd get it ready for March, just in hoping there was a little extra down at the provincial government so you could pull out and have your list right ready and say, oh, there was a little extra money in the treasury, how would you like to spend it on? But it's done. Not going to happen anymore. Uh, so I think Canada needs to pull up its socks, folks. As, as, as provinces go, Alberta is doing a good job. At least we've got a single system, we've got structures in place, the top and the bottom are connected. We've got early signs of success in the SCNs. They're not a nirvana, but the early signs are promising, and we need to support them like never before. So my hope is that this lecture conveys the message that at no time like ever before is there being now a need for research and innovation to influence practice. But but on this day, let's stop. Let's stop and think, pause, and let's give thanks. 67 important and impactful years. Eternal peace to Cy Frank. Thank you. Sorry, we're doing the shared mic thing, so I'll just get cozy with Tom as I thank him very much for a really uh, very good presentation and thought-provoking, and I think really show the work that Sai did and the ongoing advancement of that work. So thank you so much for coming to Edmonton and presenting that. And I'd like to invite Martin up to uh, uh, present a gift to Dr. Noseworthy. Here. <laughs> so we're doing the shared mic. <laughs> thank you very much, Tom. I think you've really touched on so many of uh, the great contributions that Sai made and so many have built on. And um, I hope you've set us all a major challenge going forward that, uh, that 
the means that we, we need to innovate, we need to focus on value, we need to focus on outcomes. And I think you've set the, the, the direction for us, built on the platform that Sai gave us. So on behalf of all of us here today, thank you very much for your lecture, and we'd like to, you to take this gift. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks very much. I think we're out of time for uh, questions, but please, in Edmonton, come and join us in the reception and introduce yourself thank to you Tom and, and have his. <laughs> in Calgary, thank you very much for attending, and uh, I think there's also a reception for you. Now, before we break here, I, we're going to show a video uh, tribute to Sai as well. So, Nick, if you want to set up the video tribute, that would be great. It's a huge question to ask about Dr. Frank's contributions because they've been many, they've been varied. Dr. Frank was uh, very integral in orthopedics in Canada and, and, and medicine in general. His innovation in trying to develop new ways to deliver care it was of such a great impact on both Alberta orthopedics and Alberta medicine. Well, I first met Sai um, in an interview process for the 13 inaugural scientific directors of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Everyone assured me that he was a great leader, a great individual, uh, and a great scientist. Sai and I worked closely together for the next seven years, uh, me as president of CIHR and him as one of the 13 scientific directors. One of the lasting legacies for Sai, I think, has been the establishment of this Centre for Mobility and Joint Health. The McKaig Institute is a big part of that. And what Sai always believed was the power of putting a, an engineer together with a clinician to have that collaborative uh, environment. As a researcher, he had the respect of the entire orthopedic research community throughout the world. One of the great attributes that Sai had was his ability to put it all together, to form a plan, to get people behind that plan, but then to be able to implement the plan. And that is very, very hard. Engineering, kinesiology, nursing, rehab medicine, uh, the hard sciences, rheumatology, orthopedic surgery. That was all his vision and he wanted us all mixed up. He was adamant that we had to be all rubbing shoulders day to day in this multidisciplinary group. So I really believed that research could inform better clinical care, but he worked in the real world and he understood how he had to make changes locally, how he had to make changes provincially, how he had to affect change nationally. And that really earned him a reputation in Canada and beyond as somebody who passionately believed in better clinical care for people. He had a really strong vision around the value of sharing health information and what that could mean for the improvement of providing services to the patient. He struggled with some of the injury-related things that many of his patients did, and that helped him, I think, identify with patients. I think that's what really made him who he was and why he has garnered so much respect, is because of that ability to, to relate to people, uh, no matter their background, no matter where they come from, and be able to bring people together and to share ideas. People felt like he was genuinely interested in what they had to say, because he was. The lectureship is intended to uh, promote and to make sure that those uh, enduring qualities that uh, Sai represented are continued uh, even now that he isn't with us. I think he's left a long lasting impact through institutes like the McKaig Institute, like the Alberta Bone and Joint Health Institute, um, through the way that healthcare is delivered within Alberta. And I think it'll, research will always be a big part of that. Uh, I think he'd say keep going, you know, he, he leaves behind a, a real huge number of champions that are trying to make the world a better place, that are trying to make it better for patients and it better for clinicians. Mm -hmm.